Welcome to the Audience Building Roundtable and good afternoon. Uh, this is the COVID-19 Pivot and it's June 5th and we are thrilled that you are back with us again and we are especially happy to welcome today the uh, Georgia State University School of Public Health experts uh, to answer your questions. Before we get to that, we have a couple of uh, brief announcements to walk through today. But before we go do that, I want to announce, I want to acknowledge uh, um, that you, you know we're here because we have a, we're running a forum with expert resources and peer interaction to navigate the uh, pandemic and to cope with its many levels of impact that it's having on all of you, um, our, um, our arts and culture experts in our community. Um, and that's why we activated the Audience Building Roundtable for this period of time in, in our, um, in, in, in during, this, during this period. Um, the Arthur M. Blank Family Foundation is particularly uh, committed um, to helping you um, navigate that time. And we want to also acknowledge the uh, leadership of Kenny Blank in that effort as we go through this, uh, this period. Um, we do also want to acknowledge the, the period that our um, country is going through and, um, and particularly um, the, um, the um, stand with the black community in this time and um, the arts and culture community. Um, last week you raised some questions of us and we um, had uh, on our Monday peer exchange a conversation about some of these particular issues that are uh, important to the uh, all, com all of us in the community, but particularly to our African-American colleagues. And we will be having that conversation again this coming Monday on the Peer Exchange. We want to invite you all to join us for that ongoing conversation, um, which uh, should not um, end anytime soon because these issues are not resolved. So we want to make sure that you join us for that and continue to tell us what you want to talk about and what we need to be listening to, those of us who need to continue to listen. Um, the, um, we, we do know, uh, we have a couple things coming up, as I mentioned, the Peer Exchange on Mondays in June, um, an open forum conversation. Join us at 4 o'clock. You don't need to register for that. And on Tuesday, um, you hopefully got an invitation in your inbox for Tuesday's session. Uh, we have an arts and culture expert, Alan Brown from Wolf Brown, who you should uh, know who he is. He's uh, nas nationally known. He's going to join us on Tuesday. Please register for that session at 3 o'clock. Um, check your inbox if you haven't seen that yet. Um, we have some other upcoming things um, noted here on your screen that you'll be um, seeing soon, um, that you'll hear about. Um, I won't read those to you, but you can see they'll be coming soon in your inbox. We have a session coming up on live streaming that you'll be hearing about, and a couple of other things that we have in the works. Um, we want to let you know that um, um, we also want to be supportive of Art Beats Atlanta. Um, that is the... Um, you know, Art Beats, we want to support. Many of you are already part of that group, and we want to make sure that you, um, you know, know about it, plan your weekend around it, plan your weekdays around it, your evenings, um, it's, uh, uh, letting us know what we should all be doing uh, with our time uh, while we're going through this, and you know, hopefully in the future, too. Um, we also want to um, now, without further ado, hope you get your questions ready for the experts from Georgia State University School of Public Health. Um, I'm going to introduce the moderator, Dr. Rodney Lynn, who is uh, the interim dean of the School of Public Health. And you can see up here on the screen, we have two uh, also joining Dr. Lynn, very two distinguished panelists with us, experts in the, uh, in the school. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, uh, Homa Rafi, who has been uh, wonderful. She is the helping us put this together. She is the director of communications for the School of Public Health. I want to acknowledge her help. We couldn't have done this without her. So before I introduce Rodney, I want to thank her um, in front of all of you. Um, but Dr. Lin um, and his uh, School of Public Health is, uh, are having a wonderful, uh, well-deserved moment um, uh, of recognition that um, I and many others certainly hope for, will last for a long time to come. They are um, real experts in this field, and they are um, getting worldwide recognition for the work that they have long done, um, and they are, um, are seeing um, lots of research recognition and lots of publishing recognition for the work that they are doing. Um, Dr. Lin um, is um, 
The interim dean, as I mentioned, he holds a PhD from Georgia State University in Educational Policy Studies. He has a master's um, from Georgia State in Exercise Science and a bachelor's from St. Andrews Presbyterian College um, in um, Biology and Physical Education. He, his specializations include childhood obesity, physical activity, school and community health and health policy. And um, he serves, you know, he's been serving as the interim dean and the senior associate dean for academic and strategic initiatives um, for several years now. And his research has focused on childhood obesity prevention, school and community health, and the reduction of health disparities. He has, um, within that a specialty, he has an interest in identifying effective policy and systems approaches uh, to increasing physical activity and healthy eating in children, and he has published numerous peer-reviewed peer -reviewed articles on these topics. Um, within the space of this uh, particular pandemic, he has also been a very active speaker and leader on speaking out about health disparities on this particular topic around the pandemic as well, and has gained a lot of uh, national recognition on, on this topic. So. Um, I hope you'll join me in welcoming Dr. Lin um, to this forum today, and he will be moderating the remainder of our session uh, this afternoon. So please, Dr. Lin, um, welcome, and uh, we look forward to hearing um, you and your colleagues answer our arts and culture experts uh, in, the, in our audience's questions. Well, uh, thank you so much, Terry. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me and for, for, for all of us, my colleagues, to be here with you and to serve as a resource uh, to, uh, to our community. Uh, uh, I also want to acknowledge and, you know, uh, thank the Blank Foundation uh, for all the work that they do in the city to advance uh, the health of our community. Um, you know, I've had the pleasure of working with the, the foundation over the years on, on childhood obesity and uh, in my work with Voices for Georgia's Children and, and in many other spaces. So um, we're delighted to, to have the opportunity to work in partnership with you, Terry, and, and the Blank Foundation and, and, and serve as a resource. Um, I, I want to start, um, I, I'm going to just say a word about the School of Public Health, and then I'll uh, introduce uh, the two faculty members, uh, the two experts that, that are with us today, and, and then we'll go into to questions uh, and answers. Uh, the School of Public Health uh, is one of the newer colleges at Georgia State University established in, in 2012. And we all know that, that public health is in the limelight today, um, but uh, most of the time when you tell someone you, you do public health, they, they really, well, what, what exactly is that? So, you know, I thought I would uh, just say a word about what public health really is. And there are two, really two, um, two, two, two focus areas uh, that, you know, distinguish public health from other areas of, of, of health uh, and medicine. And that is that we, in public health are, are primarily focused on prevention, uh, prevention of illness and disease and, and promotion of, of health and well-being. So that's one of the, the, the two characteristics of public health. The second uh, is really that we focus on populations. Um, you know, physicians and other clinicians tend to focus on individuals. Uh, we uh, focus our energy and resources on looking at population uh, level data. We uh, are often uh, looking at surveillance data to monitor and respond to emerging health uh, threats uh, in the population at, at large or within uh, subpopulations uh, as well. Uh, in the School of Public Health, we have a number of areas of strength. Uh, we have uh, some of our infectious disease uh, and environmental health experts with us today, so that's certainly an area of strength for us. Uh, additionally, um, we have one of the strongest tobacco prevention groups in the country. They're doing uh, some incredible work right now on e-cigarettes uh, in, in our youth population. Uh, we additionally are doing work on migrant health uh, through a prevention research center we have uh, that's situated in Clarkston, uh, the Clarkston community. Uh, and the last area I'll, I'll focus on is just violence prevention that we uh, have a, you know, a center called the Mark Chaffin Center for Healthy Development. Uh, and we also uh, house the Prevent Child Abuse uh, Georgia, Georgia uh, organization. And so they're really focused on both interpartner violence as well as child abuse, uh, child neglect. And so uh, just to give you some sense of the range of areas that we focus on uh, in the School of Public Health. As I mentioned, we've been, we, we were established in 2010 as an independent college uh, at, at the university. 
And since that time, we've grown from about 25 faculty to now over 50 faculty. Uh, our enrollment in, in terms of students has grown from uh, about 175 to now over 800 students and, and still growing. Uh, and then our research funding, we have two of our, our researchers with us today. Uh, we, we've tripled that over time to now uh, over $15 million uh, a year. So we are, we're, we're very active. Uh, we're growing quickly uh, and uh, really happy to be here to serve as a resource. Uh, before I introduce um, our, our two uh, experts, um, I want to also say that an area uh, that's central to our work uh, in the School of Public Health and to public health broadly is health equity, uh, racial equity, and racial justice. And COVID-19 received our prompt attention because of its devastating health impact, uh, but also because of the disproportionate impact that it's having on minority uh, communities, especially uh, African-American communities. And so um, we look at that data and, and, and by one report, half of the deaths in, in Georgia uh, are uh, among African-Americans as it relates to COVID-19. Uh, so now today uh, on top of that crisis, uh, we find ourselves facing uh, a pivotal moment on racial equality, justice and uh, police brutality. and. Uh, what we've seen happen recently across COVID-19 and, and the more recent uh, uh, tragedies uh, and injustice is that, you know, the, these things really lay bare the racial inequality and injustice uh, in, in our country. And, you know, while we're here to discuss questions about COVID-19, I also want to say that, you know, it's important for all of us to consider how we can help to advance anti-racist practices and, and racial equality. Uh, we're taking that on in the School of Public Health, uh, and I hope you will uh, join uh, together with us in, in advancing that work uh, in your own space and, and more broadly. So let me now um, introduce uh, our, our, our two guests, uh, two experts, and, and, and thank both, uh, both of them for, for making the time to, to be with us today. They're, they're both very busy uh, during this time. Uh, First, let me introduce uh, Dr. Lisa Casanova. And Dr. Casanova is uh, an associate professor uh, in, in our Department of Population Health Sciences. Uh, her expertise is in environmental, environmental health sciences. Uh, she holds a PhD uh, from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Uh, she's a microbiologist by training uh, whose research on environmental transmission of infectious disease uh, includes you know, looking at methods for protecting healthcare workers from exposure to, to viral diseases. Uh, she studies the survival of, of viruses in water and on surfaces and objects. Uh, she's really widely sought after for her expertise in, in protecting uh, healthcare workers uh, in this space, uh, has done work around Ebola, uh, now uh, COVID-19 uh, caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, the last thing I'll, I'll mention is that over a decade ago, as she was uh, doing her doctoral studies at, at Chapel Hill, uh, her dissertation work was, was focused on uh, coronaviruses. So she brings uh, some, some uh, real experience uh, on, on, on coronavirus to, uh, to us today. Um, our, our second um, expert is uh, Gerardo Chow, uh, and he is professor and chair of the Department of Population Health Sciences. Uh, in the School of Public Health. Uh, he also holds an external affiliation as Senior Research Fellow at the Division of International Epidemiology, Epidemiology and Population Studies at the Fogarty International Center uh, uh, with the National Institutes of Health. And prior to being with us, um, uh, Dr. Chow was a, a faculty member at uh, Arizona State University. Um, I'll also add that, you know, he, he and his team started to do forecast around COVID-19 shortly after the outbreak in Wuhan, China. Um, his his, uh, his uh, forecast is available on our website uh, for at least a dozen countries or, or more, as well as many states uh, here within the United States. Uh, his, his research also includes uh, work analyzing uh, you know, data from the Diamond Princess cruise ship, which many of you may have heard of in the news. Uh, and he's been called upon by state and national leaders uh, recently for his expertise. Uh, he's been interviewed dozens of times by uh, every outlet you can imagine, New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Time, Bloomberg, uh, you name it. So he, 
Uh, both of our guests are very busy, very uh, well regarded in their fields, uh, and uh, you know, uh, really appreciate them taking time to uh, to be with us today. So I'm going to jump us uh, off uh, with uh, a broad question. I'm, I'm going to ask them both to speak to this question uh, because uh, they may bring different perspectives to it. Uh, but one of the questions that we received, and, and I guess I'd also prompt those watching to go ahead and start sending in questions so that we can see those. But one of the questions that came in um, uh, prior to, to today from, from the group is, you know, it says, I'm not sure I understand how contagious the novel coronavirus is uh, and uh, how it spreads uh, and who is most likely to get it. And so this is really a question about uh, helping uh, you know everyone understand uh, how does this how contagious is the virus uh, how does it spread uh, as it relates to you know breathing touching things virus living on surface surfaces all of that so uh, Lisa could you uh, start us out on that question and maybe Gerardo you could chime in after sure. Uh, I think there has uh, been a lot of uh, talk in the news lately about virus transmission via surfaces and some different things that the CDC has been saying. Uh, I think it's important to remember that for this virus, the dominant mode of transmission is directly from one person to another. Uh, it's possible that surfaces might play a role in transmission. For example, uh, someone touching a surface, leaving virus on it, and then someone else touching that surface. Um, but that's something that we can interrupt uh, very effectively by using the right disinfectant, uh, by being vigilant about cleaning, and particularly uh, being very vigilant about hand washing. Uh, frequently, during the day and whenever you think that um, you might have touched something that might be shared with other people. Um, so while person to person transmission really dominates, uh, remember with surfaces, there are a couple of really simple things that we can do that help a lot with that. So wash your hands early and often. Gerardo, do you wanna to add to that? Yeah, definitely. Um, so definitely it's a highly contagious virus. Mm -hmm. um, it is a virus that has been able to, you know, spread all over the world. We are all susceptible. Um, it likes it likes to spread in confined settings, particularly in enclosed spaces. Um, so, as as uh, Dr. Casanova said, person to person spread is pretty efficient, not only uh, by close contact, but also through the air in in the airborne airborne uh, uh, mode of transmission so if we're in the same in the same room the virus is you know has the ability to potentially spread to someone that is on the opposite side of the of the room and and infect many people uh, that are in the in the same room at the same time um, so yes highly contagious virus uh, probably even more contagious than the typical influenza on, on the data that we have. And uh, this is a virus that, you know, has the ability to generate super spreading events. So people that are, for instance, in, in the same restaurant dining at the same time with someone that is sick with the virus have, you know, many of them may catch the, the virus or people that are in the same church. Um, so these are events that lead to a significant number of secondary cases. And then people can go home infect their family members, relatives, uh, and then the chain of transmission has it, uh, the ability to continue spreading in the communities. In the just, just, so I'm, just so everyone is clear, Gerardo, uh, when you and Lisa talk about person-to-person uh, -person transmission, what is the actual means of transmission from person-to-person? -person? Um, and, right. and is there a way to interrupt or uh, prevent, uh, reduce that spread. Right. So, yeah, we're talking about uh, uh, close contact, right, with someone you are potentially having a conversation 
Um, so there are these, what we call uh, droplets, right? Small particles of saliva that uh, we emit every time we talk with someone else that are, you know, traveling through the air. The biggest ones can, you know, um, land on um, the, 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 the face of the other individual. The very small ones can um, float around for a while and we can inhale them. So close contact uh, through uh, respiratory droplets would be the, the main mode of transmission. And we can stop that by you know, having a conversation, uh, wearing a face mask is probably the safest way of protecting ourselves. And not only any face mask, right? Probably if you wanna reduce the risk sufficiently uh, to a very sufficiently low level, then we should be wearing um, an N95 mask or, or something similar. It's very hard now these days to, to find the N95 mask, but there are you know, alternative uh, masks that can be used. And also by keeping the, sit, the six, um, six feet distance, right, also reduces the risk of um, contracting the virus, but by far the the safest way of um, interacting with someone else these days is by wearing a, a face mask. And and what is the value of the mask, Lisa? Um, am I protecting myself by wearing a mask? Is that the purpose of the mask, or uh, is it something else? Um, that really depends on the type of mask that you're wearing. Um, Mostly what we're seeing in public right now is a, uh, I have mine right here, uh, what we often call a surgical type mask. And what that's doing and the reason you would see it in an operating room is it's preventing you from expelling droplets into the air in front of you. So that's why a surgeon or operating room personnel would wear something like this because it's keeping them from contaminating the sterile field. Um, the thing that it doesn't do is these fabric edges don't form a seal with your face. Uh, so they're not necessarily uh, preventing droplets from getting around the mask. They may reduce the amount by which that happens, but they don't eliminate it. Um, so this type of mask is uh, protecting other people really from the droplets that you might expel. Um, the difference with an N95 mask um, is that N95s um, when used in healthcare are something that you would see a doctor or nurse wearing if a patient has uh, tuberculosis, for example, or now if they have uh, COVID-19. And an N95 mask is designed to actually uh, form a seal around your face. Um, so these are the round blue masks that have elastic straps. So they're designed to fit snugly and they're designed, if they're properly fitted to you, to form a seal around your face. So they're protecting you from droplets or particles that are coming towards you. But uh, wearing them is not simple. Um, I see a lot of them in public and if you are not uh, informed about how to wear an N95, you may not be doing it in a way that's protective. For example, you, Rodney, uh, technically should not wear an N95 because your beard would interfere with the proper fit of the seal on your face. Also, um, there is a process that healthcare workers go through. Um, it's actually a test to make sure that the N95 is fitting your face correctly and it's education about how to put it on and check the seal. Um, so while you can do a lot by wearing this kind of mask to um, protect others, it's not playing as big a role in protecting you. Um, an N95 can do that, but it's not a matter of just getting one and putting it over your head. Okay. So... I'm going to ask one more question, uh, Gerardo, um, that, that's, you know, I think really helping people understand risk. And then because of the audience that we have, I want to move us along to uh, speaking to, you know, their venues and 
some of the concerns around, you know, prevention and how many people should be in a venue and uh, those sorts of questions. But the, the, the question I want to get to before that, Gerardo, is this issue of, you know, sort of why I wear a mask if I'm not feeling ill? And you've done work on, you know, looking at the proportion of individuals who are asymptomatic, but may also be spreading uh, the virus. So could you say a word about that? And then after that, we can move to talking about specific prevention and things that, that, that uh, folks on, on the call uh, would, would need to think about for their um, venues. Yes. Yeah, definitely. So early on, back in February, um, we analyzed data that was coming out of the outbreak that was unfolding aboard the Diamond Princess cruise ship with my colleagues in Japan. And uh, one of the striking features of this coronavirus is that it's able to generate infections with no symptoms or very little symptoms, very um, uh, mild symptoms at all. And so this gives the ability for the virus to spread silently in the population, right? And now we know that these individuals that are asymptomatic are also capable of spreading the virus to others, right? So this is probably explaining why we are seeing uh, these large outbreaks all over the world and the difficulties in bringing the outbreaks under control. Um, in that particular study, we estimated that about 20% of the of the population in the of the crew and the passengers um, that were infected um, were actually asymptomatic, right? So that's a large proportion, particularly among senior people that were on board this time, Princess Cruise Ship. So in the community at large, we probably can expect that around 30% of the infections are people that are asymptomatic. So that's very concerning. So that means that even if we encounter someone that appears to be healthy and not having any type of respiratory infection, we should assume that those individuals may be carriers of the coronavirus and could be spreading the virus. So this um, emphasizes the need for uh, universal face mask wearing in order to um, control the, the spread of this coronavirus. Um, uh, the next question is really uh, specific to, to venues. Um, you know, a lot of the, our, our guests today are individuals who have responsibility for managing, directing um, venues for the arts uh, and, and, and related performances. Uh, one of the things that they really want to know is when should they, you know, open their venues for in-person interaction and performances, you know, is it now, is it August, is it October? How do they know? Um, there's so many, you know, uh, different messages uh, out there. I think some personally driven by sort of politics, uh, some driven by a need to protect at all costs. Uh, and so I think, you know, people want to know how to balance uh, what they're hearing and you know, we're certainly not the health department. We don't, uh, you know, dictate uh, what people do. But uh, based on what you are seeing, uh, your expertise, um, what is your, you know, what are your thoughts on this question? Uh, start with Lisa. Um, I'm going to respond by bouncing that question to Gerardo, who I think um, his expertise is uh, very much on point. But I would say that I am always looking at the evolving guidance coming from CDC. Roberto. Yes, um, yeah, definitely the CDC guidelines, we should be looking at those, but I will just you know, give some general recommendations and ideas that I think could uh, make these places safe. And I don't think there is the right time to, to reopen these places. Um, I'm in favor of, you know, opening these places now, as long as we follow uh, the safety safety guidelines. And I would say the, no, the number one is requiring uh, face mask wearing to all of the all of the attendees for these settings, and keeping um, you know the physical distance of six, six feet, and making any 
any accommodations in, in the setting to allow for this to be uh, viable, um, like limiting the number of attendees. And I think that, that would make a lot of sense. And also temperature checks at the entry. I think they, they will be helpful as well. They will not rule out, obviously, the infections because of the fact that we have a significant fraction of asymptomatic individuals, but they, they can still detect individuals that may be having uh, um, some um, fevers. And so that would be the first thing that I would implement. Temperature checks, making sure that every single individual that um, enters the, the, the setting is, is wearing a face mask. Um, I, I would probably go beyond that and you know require that this this face mask is not simply um, a simple you know piece of cloth, but it's a, a little bit more maybe double layer at the very least, double layer mask. Um, and um, yeah, the, the better the face mask, the, the you know the more effective the face mask is, the, the, the lower the risk for everyone inside the set. Gerardo, uh, one of the things that we've seen at the federal level is that there has been uh, support for uh, paid sick leave for, uh, you know, individuals who may not otherwise have access to that. Uh, do you think there's any value in these venues providing for, you know, uh, exchange of tickets for individuals who, you know, come down ill? I think, you know, part of the thought here is you want to give people incentives for staying home if they're not well, if they feel like they're gonna lose the money they paid for this show and not have anything in repla and to replace it, you know, people may come though they're not feeling well. So, you know, is it helpful for these uh, organizations to think about policies and, and, and communicating those that would encourage people to stay home and not penalize them in any way? Correct, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Anything that we can do, to prevent um, letting um, you know potentially infectious individuals into the setting would make makes a lot of sense. And yes, those policies I think uh, are really good ideas that should be implemented if possible. So, so we have some questions coming in um, from our audience, um, and you know we may or may not have all the expertise to cover all of these, but I'll, I'll share these. Um, you know, how much does singing and projecting on stage endanger audiences? Uh, and what is the effectiveness of true HEPA filters in air purifiers? Uh, many spaces are using them for air circulation and cleaning of the air. Are they helpful? So uh, maybe the air purifier question, you know, I don't know if we have the expertise on that, Lisa or, or Gerardo, but the singing versus, you know, talking versus breathing how much do we know about uh, what's expelled and, and, and you know, risk to people in close proximity to someone who is singing, yelling, speaking, so on and so forth? Lisa, you want to take this one? Uh, Lisa, are you there? Oh, I think that she, she froze. She looks, she looks frozen. Um, yeah, but I can, uh, I can help a little bit. Yeah. Uh, in the meantime, she comes, she returns. Um, right. So definitely, it, you know, recent research has emphasized. Oh, I think Lisa is back. Lisa, are you back? Uh, yes, I hope so. Okay. Do you want to take this one? Do, do you do you hear the, the entire question? Do you want to go ahead? I think you are probably in a better position to answer this one. Rodney, could you repeat that one? Yeah, the question was about uh, singing, you know, projecting on stage, yelling, you know, uh, does this put the audience at risk, people that are in proximity to someone? And I think a, a more general question is, you know, are we expelling more virus if we're ill when we're yelling and singing uh, than, than not? And then the, the second part of the question was about true HEPA filters and air purifiers and whether or not they're actually uh, cleaning the air and, and removing, you know, virus. Um, to the first question, I, at the moment, I don't have an answer to that that's based on the latest research. 
Um, there is a lot going on right now in research about how droplets travel when people cough, when they sneeze, uh, when they yell, and things like that. And so I think some better answers to that question are evolving right now, um, but I don't have one off the top of my head. Um, but I, I think that they're coming out of current research. Uh, for the second question about air purification, uh, HEPA filters are very, very effective. Um, they're what you find in laboratories. They're what you find on airplanes. Um, not all air purifiers are created equal. They work on a lot of different mechanisms. Some of them have HEPA filters, some of them don't. Uh, so you have to uh, make a careful selection of air purifiers and make sure that you know what it is and isn't doing. Uh, and a key thing with uh, the use of HEPA filters is um, how often the air is uh, circulating in a space. For example, how many air exchanges are taking place in a space because that makes a difference in how virus spreads. And that may be very different in a large venue than it is in something like an airplane. Uh, but that would be a question that um, building engineers and people who are familiar with the infrastructure in the venue might have the best answers to. Okay, another question here, uh, and, and there are two questions that are similar. Um, one is, uh, and I'm gonna direct this to Gerardo, how, how long can a person with no symptoms uh, be a carrier and expose others? Uh, and the second part of the question is, is there uh, a recommended per person area that is considered uh, uh, quote unquote safe? Yes, okay. Um, uh, around two weeks it's uh, it's the main period of concern for the infectious period for both asymptomatic and symptomatic individuals so if the isolation period you know it's 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 reaches two weeks i think after that the the risk of the individual to to actually you know spread the virus is very low in fact most of the infections most of the secondary transmissions occur one day or two before the appearance of symptoms. So it is a very early stage when the, the infectious individual is at, um, producing probably the highest viral load, the highest amount of shedding of the, the virus. Um, so two weeks is, is a very safe uh, period of time to, um, to, to assume that the individual is no longer infectious. And, and what is, was the second part? Is, is there a safe area, spacing, you know, distancing that is considered uh, safe? Right. And I imagine so, this is, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yes, it's a tricky one. If you are outside, outdoors, I think the six feet is pretty safe. And even if you are not wearing a face mask, I think it's, it's pretty safe. But obviously, if you wear the face mask, then the risk goes down much more. But if you are indoors, in an indoor setting, right? Um, even if you keep that six feet of uh, distance, it's, it's probably not sufficient because the virus concentration is increasing in the environment, right? And this concentration increases uh, with the amount of time the infectious individual is spending in that setting, right? So there is no safe space. The only safe way of entering the supermarket or, you know, healthcare setting or a church is by wearing a, an effective face mask. Lisa? Yeah, I think an important point that, that you're making there, Gerardo, is that um, when we're indoors, it's difficult to get the risk. It's impossible to get it to zero. Uh, and so the measures that we would promote are about reducing risk, not eliminating risk. Um, whether it's three feet, six feet, nine feet, these are about you know, reducing risk. Uh, and so as long as businesses are open, there is going to, and, and people are gathering, there is going to be some risk. Uh, the question is how do we mitigate that risk or lower that risk uh, as best we can, balancing all realities and, and, and you know, doing that in a feasible way. Uh, so I think that, you know, sharing things like a mask and, uh, you know, don't fill every seat, you know, those kinds of things um, are going to have to be part of the plan. 
Uh, Lisa, what would you recommend as it relates to surfaces, uh, whether, you know, armrests or door handles, things that are high touch, things that people are moving through? Uh, what should venues be doing and um, what is an effective cleaner? Yeah. In, in these times that we don't have lights or things like this at the store very often. Well, a couple of things. Um, I have mentioned before the uh, importance of washing hands, and I think we could uh, take an example from what healthcare facilities have been doing for a long time, which is to make opportunities for hand hygiene ubiquitous. Just make it as easy as possible to frequently clean or sanitize your hands. Um, so things like uh, small stations that have alcohol hand rub. Um, there are many different kinds of designs that are portable that you can place uh, alcohol hand sanitizer in a dispenser um, in any location you want to. Uh, many of them are now touchless, so you don't have to push a button or touch the unit at all. Um, so that's one way that you can make hand hygiene um, just something that people don't have to think about. They see the alcohol there, they can use it. Um, of course, uh, hand washing, um, encouraging people to wash their hands all the time. Uh, for surfaces, um, there are a lot of uh, very effective disinfectants out there on the market. Um, I would say uh, frequent cleaning and disinfection of uh, what we call high-touch surfaces, so door handles, door knobs, um, things like that. Um, if you want the official guidance on disinfectants. Um, the Environmental Protection Agency maintains a list of registered disinfectants. Um, whether, whenever you're buying a disinfectant, whether it's a spray product or a uh, wipe or anything like that, um, you can look at the label and um, look and see if it has a list of which organisms it has been tested for. And most of the organism, uh, most of the products that have this kind of labeling uh, will state that they're effective against viruses, for example, like influenza. So that's one of the things you can do is look at the labels of the products that you're buying. Um, so mainly um, frequent disinfection of high touch surfaces and making uh, hand washing and hand sanitizing as readily available in public venues as you can possibly by uh, frequently um, placed portable alcohol hand rub units. Okay, uh, thanks Lisa. Uh, we have a couple of questions and I'm gonna kind of combine these because they're very similar. And these are really about the performers. Uh, these are you know people that are dancing uh, or, or otherwise performing. Uh, and, you know, one of the questions is about, um, you know, moving around in the same space, uh, uh, dancing and, you know, is wearing a mask while you're doing that sufficient to uh, protect the performers, uh, you know, and is there a, you know, safe distance, uh, you know, as it relates to, um, you know, performance or can, can they perform as long as wearing a mask and do you have other ideas about how you might protect uh, both performers as well as other staff that, that work in, the, in these venues? I'll, I'll send that to you, Gerardo. That's a great question. Um, I would try and find a way to test the performers, um, you know, immediately before, a day before um, their the, the, the event. I think that's probably the, the safest way. Um, so have a negative result on, on, on them. Um, and um, if, if you cannot do that, face mask wearing is probably the way to go. If it is feasible, I'm sorry, if, if, it is, if that's feasible for the type of performance, right? Um, but otherwise, uh, testing, different tests are becoming available, available in the market, right? That could be useful to, to, to test um, specific groups um, for which it would be very difficult to, to have them participate uh, without wearing a face mask. What about uh, protection for other staff 
who are not performers, but are greeting guests, opening doors, uh, you know, showing people to their seats. Uh, you know, often, at least when I go to a performance, there's often a crowd until the door is open. Uh, you know, are there things that, they, that, that these venues can do, maybe opening the door as much earlier so that people can seat themselves as they arrive rather than uh, gather? What, what can be done there as well as for the staff and, and PP, you know, personal protective equipment uh, and so on. Um, Lisa, you want to take the protecting staff and uh, things that, that uh, venues can do there? Certainly. Uh, I think as Gerardo has been emphasizing over and over the importance of masks, um, the importance of hand hygiene and making it uh, readily available to staff as well. Uh, one thing specifically um, that I've begun seeing more and more in public spaces is people wearing gloves, uh, both uh, people just out in public and people at businesses. And it's very important to remember that gloves are not magic. Um, if you are going to provide them, for example, to employees, uh, you still have to emphasize the same messages about hand hygiene because you will carry viruses on your gloves the same way you would on your hands. Um, so if you're looking for the right kind of protective equipment for your staff, I would emphasize masks um, much more than I would recommend the wearing of gloves on a regular basis. Yeah. And I'm also thinking about a custodians, right? And those folks who are in charge of keeping certain places clean in the facility as well, we shouldn't forget about them, right? Like people that are cleaning the restrooms, they probably also need eye protection. I'm not, I'm not sure if Lisa has any opinion on this, but these are potentially places with high concentration of the virus that I would also emphasize, uh, recommend, the, the wearing eye protection, some sort of goggles that, uh, in addition to, to um, highly effective face mask. I don't know if, if Lisa has any comments on, on this. For environmental services people um, and people who are doing the cleaning and sanitizing, um, of course, you always want to make sure that uh, you are up on the OSHA requirements uh, for those kinds of jobs. Uh, and Definitely, um, those job duties often involve a higher level of PPE. So, um, of course, masks like everyone else, but also possibly goggles and gloves, uh, not only because of infection, but because of handling the chemicals involved. Okay, right. And, and they are at higher risk. They are doing this every day, right? So the probability of, you know, encountering uh, the yeah. virus. So, so another question that's come in is uh, from a museum uh, and it says that, you know, museums are really high touch points and uh, visitors use sound sticks to, you know, to listen as they're, they're walking through, I, I presume. Uh, and, you know, these are, are on tables, they're, they're really high touch and are held close to the face. Uh, should they remove the use of those altogether? Uh, or is it sufficient to clean them on a regular basis in between uh, uses? So that, that, that's one question. And, and the same person asked about, you know, they're considering an outdoor venue in the fall uh, for theater production, and, and they want to require patrons to wear masks, but they also want to sell concessions, uh, at least drinks. You know, do you have any recommendations on how to allow for concessions in a safe manner uh, as well? So. Two questions here. Maybe Lisa, you can take the part about the, the sound stick uh, as that's a, a high touch uh, uh, device. And Gerardo, you can you know, think about uh, how to make concessions safe. Yeah, that I think would definitely be um, one of the best examples of a high risk item touched by many people in sequence. Um, Certainly it can be frequently disinfected. Um, the problem with that, um, or the challenge that you may run into is that 
Uh, disinfectants need time to work once they're put on a surface or an object. So uh, if you have a situation where someone wipes down the sound stick and then five seconds later the next person picks it up, then uh, that's not the optimal situation for having uh, disinfectant work. Uh, if you are really, really looking for ways to use these, um, then one option you might look at is something that um, is sometimes used in, in the dental office space, uh, which is to cover high touch places with uh, plastic or some kind of plastic um, wrap, for example, um, that can easily be put on and taken off so that no one is touching the object itself. And if you've uh, been to the dentist, you've probably seen them use something like this on things like the handles for the lights that they use to um, see the area and things like that. So that would be one option um, if, and of course the most conservative option would be uh, to eliminate that risk by not using these devices. Gerardo, you want to say a word about concessions? Yeah. So what was the question exactly? I wasn't sure. Well, they want to they want to sell concessions, but they want to make sure they do it in a way that's keeping the patrons and the staff safe. So yeah, you know, I, you know, I have some thoughts, but if you want to, you know, try try to take this, and then that'd be great. Right. Um, so I I think it's you know face mask wearing is is very important as well, uh, and particularly for those folks that are gonna be in charge, the staff uh, would probably, you know, should be wearing a highly effective face mask, probably an N95 to protect them, because they are gonna be the ones that are gonna be at a higher frequency of contact with people, with very diverse people, and they, you know, often engage in conversation with other folks as well. So, and it's harder to keep that distance apart. So a highly effective mask for, for this stuff would probably be, be the, the way to go to keep, to yeah. keep things very safe. Yeah. Um, Lisa, there's a follow-up question on your comment. And, you know, the person is saying they never knew disinfectants needed time to work. Uh, how long till a, a disinfected surface is safe? That is why it's very important to read the label of the specific disinfectant you are using because uh, it will recommend, well, depending on the disinfectant, um, it can be a little different if you're using something like a wipe. But if you're using something like a liquid where you're going to um, mix it up and then uh, wipe or mop a surface, um, you'll get two pieces of information, the concentration and what we call the contact time. So with any disinfectant, you have to look closely at the label um, and you have to follow the manufacturer's instructions because they've tested this so that they have the right combination of the quantity of disinfectant and the amount of time that it needs to stay on the surface. But that is going to be dependent on uh, the type of disinfectant that you're using. So always follow the label recommendations. Can, can I ask something? Maybe Lisa can help us on the use of UV lights to disinfect surfaces. UV lights. Do you have? That's another way, right? And yes. Um, UV lights can work quite well. Um, they're used for applications in healthcare. Um, they're actually used for treatment of our drinking water. But they have a number of variables that strongly affect how well they work. Um, things like uh, the intensity of light uh, given off by the ultraviolet bulb, um, the distance and position of whatever you're disinfecting relative to the bulb, uh, the presence of shadows or objects in between the ultraviolet bulb and whatever you're disinfecting. So the use of UV is complicated in large spaces. And it's really not something that 
you probably want to do in a venue without expert guidance because it could give you a false sense of security. Great, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, um, so, I, oh, go ahead, Lisa. Um, I just wanted to add one thing onto Gerardo's comments about effective PPE for venue staff. Um, please remember that if you are going to issue N95 respirators to your staff um, to reduce their risk in the course of their employment, um, that introduces a number of legal requirements, um, namely OSHA requirements, um, and you need to uh, take a very careful look at those if you are considering having staff wear N95s for protection in the course of their employment to make sure that you are in compliance with those rules. So uh, I'm going to squeeze in one last question, uh, ask you to take this, Gerardo, and then I'm going to summarize and, and then uh, give the mic back to Terry. Um, in terms of how far we need to keep people, I think we've established more space means a greater reduction in risk. Um, but if people are in the same household, could they be seated together, you know, in adjacent seats? I mean, they're already together in the same house. Why would you separate them in, in the venue? So is, is that an approach as well to, to group people according to whether or not they buy the tickets together or in the same household? Oh, that's a great question, yes. So if these folks belong to the same bubble, social bubble, as we are referring to these days, they live in the same household, potentially they could be together in, in, this, in a particular spot in the space. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, definitely, yeah. Great. So uh, if I could just summarize very quickly, you know, some of what we've heard today from our, our experts, um, wearing a mask is uh, important for reducing potential spread of the virus and reducing uh, infections, uh, keeping everyone as safe as possible. Uh, the greater the amount of space in between people that are attending the shows, uh, the lower the risk uh, will be. But if, if people are in the same social bubble uh, household, they could sit uh, next to each other. Um, additionally, uh, cleaning of surfaces is important um, uh, to prevent a virus from uh, living on the surface uh, and potential uh, infection in that uh, manner. Um, uh, you may want to consider allowing people in as they arrive at the venue rather than to allow large gatherings outside of the venue. Um, we didn't talk about this, but considering one-way traffic, you know, this is the way in, this is the way out, and so you're not mixing uh, people coming in and, and, and going out. Um, you know, in terms of behavior, how do you incentivize people to make good decisions? How do you make the healthy choice the easy choice? Well, if you provide paid sick leave when people are sick, they won't, they're more likely not to come to work. Um, if uh, patrons know they will either be refunded or have an exchange uh, of their ticket, if they don't come because they're ill, they're more, li more likely not to come uh, ill. So uh, having a plan for protecting uh, patrons uh, and, 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 and staff as well uh, is, is, is critically important. Uh, there are legal issues, but we would you know, direct you to, to you know, speak with your legal counsel on liability and issues related uh, to that. But the bottom line is there's much that you can do uh, to reduce risk. And uh, we hope that uh, you know, this, this has been a helpful uh, session today. So uh, I'm gonna turn it back to you, Terry. Thank you so much, Dr. Lin and uh, Dr. Chow and Dr. Casanova. We are so grateful uh, for um, not only for your expertise, but to have access to your expertise uh, for our arts and culture leaders in Metro Atlanta. We are just uh, thrilled with the uh, content today and the content that will keep being provided because we did record this today and we'll be able to put that on our website and we will link it back to the School of Public Health website, we hope, as well with uh, Homeless Help so that we'll be able to provide that also to the people who go to the uh, School of Public Health website and see um, what you've been able to provide to our arts and culture community here in Metro Atlanta. Uh, so just a quick reminder uh, to our arts and culture leaders that um, we have a four o'clock peer exchange on Monday. Uh, open forum for discussion. And on uh, Tuesday, we have a three o'clock session with uh, Alan Brown from Wolf Brown. So please sign up for that. And we look forward to seeing you uh, twice next week 
and we look forward to uh, ongoing conversation about these very important topics. And we hope you have a great weekend. Don't forget to check out Art Beats, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Have a great weekend. Thank you.